Alien Martian Artifacts The Whole Truth Revealed The dusty red planet has fascinated us for centuries. Despite learning more about it, its mysteries continue to keep us on the edge of our seats. But have you ever wondered where our fixation with life on Mars comes from? It's been centuries since we last gave Mars a moment of peace. From the first time we noticed it hanging in the sky, closer than other worlds, brighter than other worlds, eerily redder than other worlds, we've alternately loved and feared it. But why? There are so many other beautiful planets just in our solar system, not to mention the trillions of others we now know are out there. Why Mars in particular? Among the worlds we know, Mars is not in any way exceptional. It's not the brightest, the closest, the smallest, or even the easiest to reach. It's not as mysterious as Venus, not as bizarrely colored as Jupiter or ringed like Saturn. So why? Well, the fact is, since the invention of the telescope, we've come to understand that the red planet has polar ice caps like Earth, experiences seasons like ours, has a day equal to ours, and its surface landscapes resemble our desert regions. All of this made it easy for us to tell ourselves that it was likely life had emerged there too. Decades of fervent attention to every surface change led us to an obsession with the canals, the face, the pyramids, and the meteorite with microbes. Today we know no immense engineering scars are crossing the planet's reddish surface, nor have there ever been Martian civilizations capable of erecting pyramids and mysterious monuments. Yet the issue of the canals in the Martian face has kept several generations of Earthlings holding their breath. Keep watching, we'll try to explain why. Since civilizations first looked up at the sky, humans have tracked Mars and charted its capricious path through the heavens. When the Sumerians followed this wandering star crossing the sky in the 3rd millennium BCE, they noticed its eerie color and associated it with the evil deity Negrol, god of pestilence and war. Its movements and variable brightness foretold the death of kings and horses and the fate of harvests and battles. The Greeks associated it with Ares, named after their god of war, which the Romans rebranded as Mars. But so far, it's all about myth and the suggestion of that dark blood-like color. No one was thinking about Martians yet. It was only around the mid-1700s that telescopes began to transform Mars into a real world. As soon as it came into focus, Mars became a planet with weather conditions, changing terrains and polar ice caps like Earth. Nothing to share with what telescopes showed when pointed at Mercury and Venus. In other words, nothing. Or with the cold and incomprehensible geometries being discovered on Jupiter and Saturn. Mars was therefore a world like Earth, so why not think it could be inhabited? And what was just a hypothesis for a few decades suddenly became a certainty for almost everyone when the canals came into play. Perhaps you already know how things went. On the night of August 23, 1877, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Scaparelli pointed the telescope of the Milan Observatory towards Mars, which was at its closest distance to Earth. He continued his observations until March 1878, and in the end, Scaparelli revealed that the planet's surface was crisscrossed by a dense network of linear structures, converging at nodes corresponding to the position of some particular geological feature. Carelessly in his writings, he referred to them as canali, channels, and perhaps there was a linguistic misunderstanding among the causes of which was about to happen. The Italian term canal can refer to both a natural structure like the English Channel and an artificial one like the Suez Canal. However, in English, the two meanings have different terms, channel for natural and canal for artificial. The latter term was chosen to translate Scaparelli's writings, misleading the intentions of the astronomer. Outside Italian borders, the impression was that he was clearly advocating the existence of an extraterrestrial civilization. The canals of Mars soon became famous, giving rise to a flurry of hypotheses, controversies, speculations, and folklore about the possibility of the Red Planet hosting sentient life. 
Initially, the Italian scientists avoid stating that those structures could be of artificial origin. Instead, he argued that they must be the product of some geological process on the Red Planet. He wrote, rather than true canals in the form we are familiar with, we must imagine shallow depressions in the ground, extending in straight lines for thousands of kilometers, with a width of 100, 200 kilometers or even more. I've already pointed out that, in the absence of rain on Mars, these canals likely constitute the main mechanism through which water, and organic life with it, can spread on the dry surface of the planet. But by then, the stone had been cast. In 1882, the famous English astronomer Richard Proctor wrote a letter to the Times claiming that the canals could only be a marvelous work of Martian engineering. This thesis was openly supported by the Frenchman Camille Flammarion and a hundred other astronomers who published articles and essays that mostly extolled the rediscovered Martian brothers. Even the wealthy astronomy enthusiast Percival Lowell was caught up in the fever. He built the Flagstaff Observatory specifically to dedicate himself entirely to the Red Planet, further fueling popular excitement. According to Lowell, the canal builders were extremely intelligent beings, engaged in overcoming an environmental catastrophe that forced them to construct gigantic irrigation canals to bring water from the poles to the equator. His conviction was authoritative and contagious. Even Nikola Tesla got caught up in the moment and reported detecting radio signals coming from Mars. Before moving on, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Make sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on our daily videos. Even Scaparelli himself joined the ranks of the Martian supporters when, during the opposition of 1881, he observed in astonishment how some of the canals suddenly started to double. For many, this could only mean one thing. On Mars, seasonal variations caused the dense vegetation growing on the canal banks to appear darker. It was sheer delirium. With this discovery, Martians definitively entered the collective imagination, making their way into books, art, and popular sentiment. Scientific circles experienced happy years, filled with a widespread sense of cosmic brotherhood, which soon gave way to a period of fierce disillusionment. The first blow to the canals in Martians came from Vincenzo Cerli, another Italian astronomer, who demonstrated in one of his publications that the web of straight lines on the Martian surface could simply be explained by a phenomenon called optical integration. This is when the human mind tries, where possible, to relate vague and indistinct images, like those seen through the telescopes of that time, to common experiences. The explanation was accepted with relief by almost all astronomers of the time, especially by those who had never been able to see the canals but were always ashamed to admit it. However, this did not entirely mitigate the widespread certainty that Mars was a living and inhabited planet. In the 1950s, a subsequent wave of observations revealed that the Martian polar caps contracted and expanded seasonally, forming a dark band along the edges that extended almost to the equator. This phenomenon was immediately interpreted as evidence of a region irrigated by water from the caps, where vegetation bloomed and withered with the seasons. Hope began to rise again. Then in 1965, NASA's Mariner 4 seemed to forever sweep away the myth of the Red Planet. The spacecraft captured the first close-up photographs of the Martian surface, transforming the rich playground of pop culture into a desert landscape full of craters. It was a real disappointment. It became evident that everything our imagination had put inside Mars was missing. There were no tree-lined canals, no water, and no vegetation. Most importantly, no Martians. But it didn't take long for the idea of life on Mars to reignite. You see, there is a place on Mars called Cydonia, located in the Arabia Terra region, in the transition zone between the southern highlands and the northern plains. This transition is characterized by wide valleys filled with debris and isolated mounds of remains of various forms and sizes. At the very center of this region stands a large stone face carved into a small hill, stretching a couple of kilometers in length, gazing stoically at the sky. It's a face with an unfriendly expression, 
but somehow it appears human. It exists in a landscape where many low hills exhibit strange and tortured shapes, perhaps the result of ancient mud flows followed by wind erosion. Judging by the number of impact craters, the surrounding terrain seems to be at least a few hundred million years old. The little hill is just one among the many other rough features of the Martian landscape, measuring only 2,500 meters in length and 1,500 meters in width. At its highest point, it rises about 300 meters. How did we come across it? Well, it was all thanks to the Viking 1 orbiter, which on July 25, 1976, took a low-resolution and wide-field image of the Cydonia region. And it was mainly thanks to the mission controllers at the Jet Propulsion Lab who patiently examined everything the Viking was transmitting to Earth. Every surface feature was magnified and scrutinized, and when the face appeared on the monitors, it's needless to say that it made a great impression. But the amazement was short-lived, and the unsettling structure was soon judged for what it was, merely a geological curiosity on the tumultuous Martian surface. In fact, a few days later, probably to promote the Viking mission, the photo of the face on Mars, as it was called from then on, was fed to the media with this caption. This picture is one of many taken in the northern latitudes of Mars by the Viking 1 orbiter in search of a landing site for Viking 2. The picture shows eroded Mesa-like landforms. The huge rock formation in the center, which resembles a human head, is formed by shadows giving the illusion of eyes, nose, and mouth. The feature is 1.5 kilometers one mile across, with the sun angle at approximately 20 degrees. The speckled appearance of the image is due to bit errors, emphasized by enlargement of the photo. The picture was taken on July 25th from a range of 1,873 kilometers or 1,162 miles. All clear now? Not by a long shot. The image quickly circled the world. And naturally, the media presented the news in a way that suggested the face was indeed evidence of an ancient Martian civilization, without reporting NASA's opinion in any way. Self-proclaimed Mars mystery scholars popped up like mushrooms, accusing scientists of wanting to downplay a reality that was evident to all, without realizing that if the space agency had wanted to conceal the matter, they could have simply refrained from showing the initial photo and it was the only source of Martian surface images available at that resolution at the time. And here's the final part. Many eagerly jumped onto the topic with programs, talk shows, scandalous newspapers, books, and websites competing to have the most sensational or outlandish theories. Even pop culture became a spokesperson for it with shows and movies like The X-Files or Mission to Mars in comics like Martian Manhunter and other forms of media. However, this whole affair quickly turned into a whirlwind whose sole purpose, as it soon became clear, was to make money for anyone capable of writing books that tickled the curiosity of some unsuspecting enthusiast of alien civilizations. Reading these books, one discovers that the Martian Sphinx is not alone. In the same geographical region called Cydonia, Martian monument experts claim to have identified a gigantic five-sided pyramid, aligned with other strange objects baptized by Cydonia experts as the city, the dome, the fortress, and so on. The nomenclature of these formations doesn't suggest that they are natural objects in any way. Naturally, even popular New Age beliefs embrace this kind of news. Following well-known patterns, they found mathematical and geometric connections between the objects that were discovered. In short, it was the classic bad numerology applied randomly. It was entirely futile for NASA to counter-argue that such formations also exist on Earth, especially in Antarctica, where wind erosion from the impact of fine particles carried by strong and nearly constant winds transforms irregular ice mounds into small pyramids called Dreykanter, three sides in German. Considering that Martian winds are much stronger than those on Earth, it provides a plausible explanation for the alleged Martian pyramids. To definitively silence the conspiracy theorists, NASA decided to take a second look at Cydonia as soon as they were able to send a new orbiter around Mars. That happened on April 5, 1998, 
when the Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft managed to capture an image of the Martian face from a distance of 444 kilometers, with a resolution 10 times better than the Viking orbiter achieved in 1976. The result was as expected. The face on Mars was merely an eroded hill shaped by the wind. No signs of artificiality, just wind and sand had worked for millions of years, and perhaps water, which must have flowed there once in small streams. It was the definitive end of our childish dream of finding intelligent life on Mars, even if long extinct. After the canals and the face, what else is there left to dream about? Pointless discussions about mermaids, bare-faced craters, dinosaur-shaped rocks, flying spoons, ancient bones, blueberries, Donald Trump's head, spiral petroglyphs. In other words, all that assortment of bizarre things people keep seeing in photos taken by the numerous rovers that have roamed the plains and mountains of Mars in recent years. Nothing else of seriousness remains for us to debate or squabble over. We'd be content with any microorganism as long as it's Martian. But apparently even this satisfaction will be denied to us. We'll have to look for life much, much farther from here.